Hey, YouTube theologians, it's a Sunday drive home on a Monday afternoon. Uh, sorry for the sun in your eyes. Uh, the uh, I want to think about something very specific. Sorry I, this is coming to you guys late. We had an installation up in Dallas for Pastor Shilke yesterday, which was really cool. Uh, but anyway, um, but we had our Bible class yesterday on baptism. And this is such a wonderful thing to think about, the Lord's gift of baptism. And, and the Lutheran understanding of baptism, that it's necessary for salvation, that it is salvific, and so forth. But this always gets so much kickback from the internet, where everything goes to be fought over. But not just on the internet. I mean, for, for generations, the church, the, the, the non-Roman Catholic church has been fighting about baptism. And I want to reflect a little bit about this because one of the arguments, one of the things that occurs to me whenever I'm talking to an evangelical or whoever, a reformed or someone who is not a Lutheran about baptism, one of the things that comes up is they're using all of the Bible texts that aren't about baptism to describe their doctrine of baptism. By grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourself, not of works that no one can boast. Therefore, baptism doesn't save as if baptism is a work and therefore it cannot save. Or, and this is a, another interesting thing, about what about all the people in the Bible or in experience who are Christian apart from baptism? The common example is the thief on the cross who Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And yet the guy we presume, I guess we presume, wasn't baptized. I mean, he could have been baptized. Um, who knows? But anyway, we just guess that he wasn't baptized. And so we say, well, here's an example of a person who was saved apart from baptism. And so this kicks back against the Lutheran idea. And But what I, re I think I'm, what I realized is that there's two misunderstandings there. The first is that whenever you're talking to Protestants in general, kind of your American evangelical Protestant, one of the questions that's always coming up is, what is the bare minimum necessary for salvation? Like, what is the least amount of something that has to happen for a person to be a Christian? And I think, now, now try to see if this is, you can tell me if this is helpful in the comments. Try to track with me on this. I think that what has happened in the evangelical imagination is that because we're saved by grace through faith and not by works, it, it that is understood to be a sort of a minimalistic thing. Like, when it says we're saved by grace, that means that it, we're reducing down the thing that saves us. Like this whole realm of works, but grace is just simply one thing. And so you get the idea that, well, as long as a person believes in Jesus, or as long as a person accepts Jesus, or as long as a person calls on Jesus, like there's this, like, there's this like minimum understanding of the least amount of whatever someone has to do in order to be a Christian. And if you add anything to that minimum standard, then you've destroyed the doctrine of grace. So, so you'll get people talking about like, well, all you have to do to be a Christian is believe in Jesus. All you have to do to be a Christian is to trust Christ. All you have to do is whatever. It's like, the, it's like salvation by grace through faith means that salvation is a minimalistic sort of thing. Now, I think that's a confusion of the biblical doctrine. Because the Lord is never interested in sort of the, the minimum requirement for salvation. That's just not the way Jesus works. He's, remember in Luke it says that Jesus talks about how you'll be like the guy who has his lap and the cup is pressed down and it's overflowing and it's spilling over. That with the Lord there's always this abundance with which he treats us. So, so repentance is not a one-time minimalistic thing. Salvation is not a one-time minimalistic thing. The forgiveness of sins is not a one-time minimalistic thing. The Lord is just simply, like, just over and over and over, uh, 
serving us and blessing us and saving us. So it, the, the parallel, I think, is like the question, well, what, what do you have to do to be married? What's the absolute minimum requirements that you have to engage in to be considered married? Well, you got to sign the certificate. Do you just have to sign the certificate? Or do you just have to say, I do? Or do you just have to uh, go to the justice of the people? Like, what's the absolute minimum thing needed to be married? Well, I got to tell you that if you're asking that kind of question, it's not good. <laughs> That's not how we're supposed to think about marriage. It's like the, you know, the old joke where the wife says to her husband, why don't you ever tell me that you love me? And he says, well, I told you on our wedding day and I'll let you know if it ever changes. <laughs> God is not like that. He's always forgiving, always blessing, always saving, always... redeeming, rescuing, always doing this. Now, what happens is if you take this kind of evangelical Protestant idea of the minimum requirement for salvation and you pair that with the statement that baptism saves, what happens? Well, if baptism saves, because we're always looking for the bare minimum, is that it knocks out faith or it knocks out uh, hearing the preaching or it knocks out repentance or it knocks out whatever else. Because there can only be one thing that saves, <laughs> faith or whatever. And so as soon as, you, as soon as the Protestant ear hears a Lutheran say, baptism saves, they think, well, that means faith doesn't save. Well, no, that's not what, no, faith, it's the, it's the Reformation that made that famous. Faith alone. Grace alone. That's the, that's the point. But what is, what is our faith trusting in? It's trusting in the promise of forgiveness that the Lord gives us in the preaching of the gospel, that the Lord gives us in the gift of baptism, that the Lord gives us in the Lord's Supper, that there's, a, there's an abundance in the way that the Lord gets His grace and His mercy to us. So, when, when, when the Lutheran says that baptism saves, they're not excluding faith. They're not excluding repentance. They're not excluding believing the gospel. They're not excluding these things. There's a, there's a richness in the way the Lord gets his mercy to us, and baptism is one of those ways that he does it. Uh, there's a great little section where Martin Luther writes in small cold articles, and he says that God is a, incredibly abundant in his mercy to us, and his consolation comes in all these multitude of forms, and it comes in the preaching, it comes in baptism, it comes in the supper, etc. Now, the necessity of baptism is established in John chapter 3, where the Lord says, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying, look, I don't intend for you guys to have another way to be born again. You have, must be baptized. But the absence of baptism doesn't damn someone. That's why Jesus is so careful to tell us in Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It's not the lack of baptism that condemns. It's the lack of faith that condemns, always. And there's no kind of confusion or contradiction in this in, in the Lutheran way. So anyway, so I think that's why there's this kickback. So people say, well, I know all these people who are Christians and they weren't baptized. God be praised. That doesn't... But how, how great that then the Lord gives them this opportunity also to receive his mercy through the gift of baptism. So, so anyway, I hope that's helpful. Uh, that, that whenever we talk about uh, salvation, we're not just talking about, we're not just talking about one way that the Lord gets the forgiveness to us. He wins the forgiveness, he wins our redemption, he wins our salvation by his death and resurrection. That's it. That's the only way that we're saved, by the death and resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus gets the death and resurrection, the news of the death and resurrection, the promise of the death and resurrection, and the benefit of the death and resurrection to us in a bunch of different ways.
He gets it to us in the preaching of the gospel. He gets it to us in meditating on the word. He gets it to us in baptism, in the Lord's Supper, in the absolution, in the conversation that we have with one another. He gets his mercy and his promises to us in all these different ways. And we rejoice in that, in the, in the multitude of the ways that the Lord has mercy on us. Anyway, I hope that's helpful for the conversation about baptism. Uh, hey, some more on Christmas coming up tomorrow and the next day. So stay tuned here. You can subscribe and, and keep in uh, touch here as well. God's peace be with you.